and welcome to all of our Gold viewers who are here with us today. I'm Kristen Schwarz, licensed midwife and one of the MCs here at Gold. And today I'm chatting with Lillian Scott. Welcome, Lillian. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here today. It's wonderful to have you here. You are part of our um, add-on package for our Tongue Tie Conference this year, our first full conference. We had Tongue Tie Symposiums in the past, but this is our full conference. And you're part of the lecture pack, Navigating Challenges in the Care of Tongue Tied Babies. Um, fantastic to have you here. Oh, thank and you. Before we talk about your presentation, it's an exciting presentation. You're looking into exploring the impact of ankyloglossia on swallowing and complementary feeding. A fantastic topic. But before we get dive into that, tell us a little bit about your background. I know you're an IBCLC and also a speech language pathologist. So give us a little overview of your work. Yeah, so thankful for great mentors who led me to this path where I realized I wanted to be a speech language <laughs> pathologist doing dysphagia as well as a IBCLC. Um, so in my day to day clinical care, I have the opportunity to work on an amazing feeding team where we're very interdisciplinary with gastroenterology, dietitian, other SLPs and IBCLCs. Um, for families who want to breastfeed. So tongue tie is a discussion of our day, almost every day um, mm -hmm. from start to finish. We also work with medically complex individuals. So babies weaning from feeding tubes, medically complex mm -hmm. kids who've spent large amounts of time in the NICU. Uh, so it really gives me an opportunity to continue to do critical thinking and solve puzzles and work with families and support them each and every day. And I'm really excited to do that. That's fantastic. You mentioned you're part of a care team. It sounds like a really interdisciplinary and, and a fantastic holistic approach that you have there in your, in your work, right? Yeah. And even when I'm not a part of that care team and working more independently, I've got so many amazing community providers in different disciplines. So unfortunately, a little bit difficult for families who access that way because they have to go to different offices, um, but great about collaborating and communicating and learning from them as well and the research that they're reading. Um, well, tongue tie has become a little bit over the last few years, a bit of a hot topic, right? And a lot of, you know, there is research, but there, we still need more research, of course, and such. But there's been also some pushback from some providers to say, oh, this is everything is a tongue tie now. What's happening here? We didn't have that a few years back. What's going on? What have you seen in your field? All of that. <laughs> All of that, <laughs> for sure. Um, still to this day, even last week. <laughs> A uh, provider sent a lovely referral for a feeding evaluation, but they had the family had seen that provider um, in a discipline that can do a phrenotomy for tongue tie, and they said that it wasn't, and I respectfully disagree. Um, so I think, I, unfortunately, I feel like tongue tie is often viewed as a religious belief, and mm -hmm. I hope that we're all getting more in tune with the research, but I also understand the research is not as clear and high right. level and detailed study as we want it to be. So it makes these, these cases even harder than some other mm -hmm. areas of me medicine where there are more, more detailed research or we could do those studies to say like, yes, this intervention is working very clearly or it's not. I think it's so complex in how we compensate in our bodies and move our bodies that everyone is so different and it's so individualized. So individualized, yes. And and I'm also thinking about the parents too. Uh, some parents uh, might not be open to a release. Uh, you know, they, they might say also, oh, I want to check out what other options we have first before we get that route. So you have to work with, uh, you know, that be able to work with that as well, right? When you, even if you're clearly thinking that might be a good option, but um, you have to meet the families where they are as well. But speak a little bit about that too. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, we love our physical therapist. I love the physical therapist. So mm -hmm. especially with head preference and torticollis, which you'll see a case study in the presentation about um, going straight to a surgical procedure is not always the best option for the patient or what mm -hmm. the family wants to do. But even rushing into a surgical procedure is not the best and going to magically fix everything either. So I think continuing to say, well, this is how we're suspecting tongue tie or we've confirmed it, but these are the other things that are also impacting. What does that family have bandwidth for and what aligns with their approach to medicine? 
Right. Absolutely. Uh, you made a good point there. It is also not wise to rush into a surgical procedure without preparation and and um, education as well. That's that's a good valid point there as well. Now let's talk about your presentation, exploring the impact of ankyloglossia on swallowing and complementary feeding. I absolutely love that because when we uh, often think about tongue tie, we think about very, you know, some very little babies who maybe have um, concerns or issues with breastfeeding. And often, you know, in that situation, not only, but like one of the first things we look at is the latch, right? But you're focusing on swallowing. And I want to learn a little bit more about that. So talk to me about that there. <laughs> yeah, I think this presentation is really three topics wound up into a brief 60 minute presentation. So it's really, it was really fun reading the research and trying to put it together. But also I was like, oh my, too much information, not enough time to really get my <laughs> cogs turning and present it in a way, hopefully that is concise and complete for you, the listeners. Um, but as we move into learning about complementary foods and how that differs across the world and in different cultures, the age of introduction, the types of food being offered, and what we know about tongue time with most of that research being done in the infants, how can we address and diagnose appropriately and make appropriate recommendations for that family when angioglossia is impacting development of mastication? I think that's really needs a lot of thought and hopefully you'll learn more in the presentation, but hopefully it'll also just get the wheels spinning on how we take these three bigger areas and fold in what we do and don't know into our clinical work and our assessment and treatment. Mm -hmm. And I know in your presentations, what I've seen so far is you have a lot of examples, you have videos that you're going to show case studies. So um, you'll give some great examples. Um, and I'm now thinking also about the parents when you work with them, how do you educate them? Do you give them also video tools or because I mean, you know, it's sometimes a little bit abstract for the parents to understand exactly what is going on, correct? Correct. Very correct. And I want to thank all of the families that allowed me to share their case studies and their children's videos for the learning of for each and each of y'all viewing. Um, unfortunately, I do have this some videos that I'm able to share with families to demonstrate, but also chewing, swallowing and ankyloglossia are so complex that I mm -hmm. there's not this one kid is the spitting image of this other case that we had right. a while ago. Let me show you these videos. I also think it's a lot of counseling and mental health that is wrapped up into feeding because parents obviously want to be amazing parents and are doing the best they can with the resources and information that they have and they want to make the best decisions. But sometimes that's obviously really stressful and especially in right. the postpartum window and postpartum depression can go on for two years or more that really figuring out kind of what what's the root of the stress in the context of this feeding and what can we do and how should that plan balance for this family. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I don't think it's a one or two session thing for many people. I think it's a very different plan for each family and where they are and how they're dealing and what works for them that there's not a recipe or a package to say. Yeah. It's not one fits all. And not I love how you, how you approach uh, includes mental health and counseling, because this is so important. You know, we're not just isolated. You know, the baby is not just a mouth and swallowing in your little body. But well, I mean, the diet, the diet in the family, you know, it all goes together. It all ties in together. And, uh, you know, stress, as you mentioned, can be uh, have a big impact on on mental health uh, there as well. So I, I think it's wonderful that you address that in your sessions as well. Um, you spoke about cultural differences, and I know you're going to speak about that in your presentation because, yeah, around the world it is different what we feed, how early we feed, and, uh, you know, um, a transition to solids or, you know, a mixture of that. Some, some cultures have their own family food, others are more, uh, by, you know, because of marketing, buying into the commercial food. So it is also important to see where the family is, right, and, and uh, you know, adjust the plan, feeding plan according to that as well? Yeah, definitely. I think understanding what foods are available in the home. I often use the example when I'm talking to parents on 
if nobody eats a green vegetable in the house, then why are we serving green vegetables? Like mm-hmm. this kid's going to associate that with poison. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then every now and then a parent will be like, oh, green vegetables really make me feel uneasy and I don't eat them. And I'm like, okay, so we're going to have to work on your plate as well if you want this to be an expectation for <laughs> for your child here because they have to see it modeled. So I think Uh, mm -hmm. um, as many folks would probably relate, parenting probably unmasks some things that us as adults are also (laughs) uncomfortable with that we have to do a little bit of reckoning. Um, (laughs) And I did have a parent that is very uncomfortable from her past, how she was raised and transitioned to solids with pureed peas or green vegetables Mm -hmm. and looked at me just this week and was like, you notice this is green and I'm doing it right. (laughs) And was able, has been working on herself too, because she wants her kids to, to eat those foods and not, not also refuse them. So (laughs) I think really understanding also what's available because if a family cannot afford the beautiful, luscious vegetable aisle and that's not what they're serving, then how can we expect that kid to develop the chewing skills need for those textures if dried crunchies are primarily the only food offered at home? Obviously, there's some other barriers that I would love to support that family with and getting those nice fruits and vegetables at home. But really, what are they purchasing? What's in their closet, their pantry or their kitchen? And I often ask families, always ask families to bring foods to the session, something that's easy, something that you want them to take that they're not taking so we can assess that piece too and better understand what's being served at home. Fantastic. It sounds like really such a comprehensive and holistic um, approach to, you know, serving your families there and counseling them. Thank you so very much, Lillian. We are looking forward so much to the presentation here at Gold that you have with us. And before I let you go, any final words for our viewers here from your side? I um, I just want to say thank you for being a part of the conference and attending. And do know that my presentation is jammed packed with information. <laughs> I expect you and encourage you to take to hit pause because it is a recorded presentation and digest the information before moving to the next section. Because that is definitely what I did in digesting the research and preparing it for you for today. Fantastic. Great tip, Lillian. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure hosting you here today. And thank you for sitting down with me here to uh, talk about the great work you're doing and your presentation here at Gold. Great. Thank you for having me. And for some information for our viewers now, our Gold Tongue Tie Conference, our first one, we had our Tongue Tie Symposium in the past, will start in September. You can get information already on our website, goldtongtie.com. You can check that out. And there you'll find also the lecture pack that uh, this presentation here is part of as well. So check that out. And we hope you see, we'll see everyone at the conference. Thank you all for watching and see you at the conference. Bye-bye, everyone.